I've always loved art. Painting, portraits, sculptures, anything you name it. But whenever I put pen to paper and actually try to draw something, it does not end well. My stick figures look more like spaghetti and meatballs, and my portraits look more like the love child of a potato and an octopus. But I refuse to let my lack of artistic ability hold me back, and so that's why I built a GAN, a generative and versatile network, in order to turn my nasty looking sketches into some beautiful portraits. <laughs> So I just created a machine learning algorithm that's able to take my barely doodled passing sketches and turn it into some fantastic, stunning photographs. I did this by building out the CycleGAN, which is a specific type of generative adversarial network that has two generators and two discriminators. Our generators are kind of like forgers trying to replicate pieces of art, and the two discriminators act as detectives that are trying to catch the reels from the fakes. The main idea behind the CycleGAN is to maintain cycle consistency which in my case just means that my sketches should be able to get, turn into photos, turn back into sketches, and these two sketches should resemble as much as possible. So the general process of building this AI was pretty simple. I first obtained some data and organized it. I defined an architecture based on the original CycleGAN paper. I trained this architecture on my data and outputted a model. And then I gave this model my sketches and got some beautiful looking photographs. Okay, I lied, it wasn't that easy. But let's get into some technical details to try and understand how this model works. The first step was to collect some good data because otherwise my model would have been practically useless. I had a couple different good options to choose from, such as the IAT data set, the Cuff Space Sketch data set, the Pretty Face and Pix2P data sets, as well as any product or architectural one out there. There are a lot, but I realized that I wanted to be able to create human portraits. And so I decided to go with the Cuffs and Pretty Face data sets. The Cuffs data set was really well drawn photos, whereas the Pretty Face one was more general rough sketches. And so I chose both of these in order to really well generalize my model. I wanted the IAT data set as well, but it was harder to gain access to that one. So I just stuck with these two. Although it's not a requirement for the CycleGAN that there is a corresponding photo and sketch for a photo, I decided to go with these two sets because they had mostly corresponding sets of data, which would be really helpful in creating a robust model. And then I used many filters and functions to basically restructure this data and put it into train and test folders for these two domains. The second step was transforming and grabbing data. For the transformations, the images are first simply resized to our specific dimensions using the bicubic resampling filter. And this is just a high quality resampling filter that produces smooth artifact free results. The only downside is it's a little bit slower. And then as always, the images are converted to a tensor to be manipulated and have differential equations calculated. And the tensors are finally normalized to a regular Gaussian distribution with a mean of 0.5 and a standard deviation of 0.5. I also define our train and test data loaders, which are kind of like factories that will take our data and apply our transformations to it before I actually put it in the model. This third step was working with the residual data buffer and decaying learning rates. So there are a couple different functions that I needed to build out specifically for the cycle GAN. And the first one I built out was the replay buffer. This basically stores the number of images after they are produced. In our case, this will be 50 as described in the paper. And when a generated image is requested, a newly or previously generated image with a 50% probability will be returned. This will be important later on when I show you the loss functions, which we'll be using to grade our model. By using the buffers, it actually allows the model to see a diverse range of images rather than just the most recent batch and really helps keep the model stable. The second thing I implement is a method to decay the learning rate. Following what was described in the paper, I incrementally decay the learning rate to zero after reaching 100 epochs of training, and this helps our model avoid oscillations as well as overshooting. This code basically works by returning smaller and smaller learning rate values after hitting the decay start epoch value. And the third thing I implement is the residual blocks, which are another important feature leveraged by the cycle GANs. These blocks are simple models that extract features but do not change the data size. They add their outputs to the input and pass this on to the next e sequence of operations. By adding these shortcuts or skip connections to flow information, residual blocks help prevent the vanishing gradient problem that many deep deeper networks witness that cause degrading performances. I implement the residual block described in the paper comprising of reflection padding, convolution, instant normalization, and the ReLU activation. The next step was to build out the generators and discriminators. 
Unlike traditional GANs, we have two generators in the cycle GAN, one that translates images from domain A to B and one that translates it back from B to A. Both of these models will have the same architecture, but will learn their own parameters through training. This model begins by downsampling the image by half during feature extraction. Next comes the residual blocks that do not change image size. And finally, the model upsamples the blocks by a factor of two with nearest neighbor interpolation. As for the discriminators, we also have two of them, one that's going to be evaluating our photographs as real or fake, and one that's going to be evaluating the sketches. The cycle GAN uses the patch GAN technique, which classifies images as real or fake by looking at patches rather than the images overall, and this produces high quality results as the discriminator can focus in on fine details and textures. The model begins by downsampling the images by a factor of 16 for the width and height, and then adds padding to maintain spatial shape during the 4x4 patch GAN. We can now move on to step number five, which is actually training the model. We've now defined all of the hyperparameters, helper functions, architectures needed for the model, and so we can write out the code for the training process itself. For each epoch, I grab a batch of data, convert them into tensors, and define some adversarial ground truths. I compute the losses of all the models and run the optimizers on the sum of the losses. The losses used in the cycle GAN are actually very important, and there's three in specific that we use. The first one is the identity loss, where giving the sketch to photo generator, I give it a photograph and see how similar the original and final photos are. There's the regular GAN loss, where I put a sketch into the sketch to photo generator and I get the discriminator to grade threes as real or not. The generator loss will be computed by comparing the final result to a tensor of ones because we want the generator to be able to produce good fakes. And I get the discriminator loss by comparing the final results to a tensor of zeros because we want a good detector as well. Finally, the third loss is the cycle loss, which as I described at the start of the video, takes a sketch, turns it into a photograph and converts that back into a sketch and checks how, how closely these two resemble. Finally, the optimizers take a step to update weights and parameters in the right direction and I log the results. Now, finally, after all that training, I can actually show you guys the results. So as you guys can see, this is our final output. I only ended up being able to train for 60 epochs, but regardless, the results are still pretty astounding. As you can see, taking in these sketches from our a validation set, our generator is able to create these pretty good looking photographs. And right below that, we can see the actual photographs that are corresponding with these sketches, and they actually match pretty good. I didn't expect the results to turn out that good, but it maps the sketches to the photos pretty well. And even the other way around, our photo to sketch generator works fairly well and gets some really good details in. And most of the sketches turn out much better than the original. So I'm pretty happy with these results. Over here, these are some previous epochs of training as well that I had saved in the output files. As you can see, even here, the photos turned out pretty well, even in earlier epochs. I will say one thing I've realized is that each epoch of training kind of had its own biases and nudges in a certain direction. Over here, a lot of the models seem to have darker hair and lighter backgrounds. Over here, they seem to have brown hair, different colored backgrounds. And over here, everyone seems to have white backgrounds and different hair colors. And so in terms of future improvements, I definitely think that a model like this should have the ability to change these certain features such as hair colors, background, and be able to edit these features in order to really have this model be usable usable in industry and in number one product creation and development architecture and all these places you'd want to tweak these. So that's definitely one place where this model would need to be improved. Aside from the validation set, I actually drew out my own uh, images and put it through the model to see if it could help me with my poor drawing skills. And um, I'll scroll down and show you guys the results for that. But um, considering my drawings over here are not the best barely doodle passing sketches, I put it through the model and honestly, the results aren't that bad. I will say they still do not look like real people, but it was able to colorize them and turn them into photos. This one is definitely my favorite. I feel like she is definitely starting to look more like a human and I'm surprised for this one in specific that our model was able to save it and make it look like a decently well-drawn photo. <laughs> I also grabbed some slightly better looking sketches from online to see how our model would perform on that. These ones are still not much better, but definitely look a lot more like people than my drawings. And when I put it through the model, it's actually pretty good. It colorized them and made them look more like people so that they're a lot more recognizable and you can put a face to these images now. 
But yeah, that's it for all the code. I honestly didn't expect the results to turn out as good as they did. Um, but yeah, if you're anything like me and want to turn your sketches into some good looking photographs, do let me know. I can hook up a front end to this and help anyone become an artist for free. But that's it for me. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.